Hey there, students. In this lecture, I want to discuss the differences between aristocratic versus democratic republics and focus specifically on the transition of the United States from an aristocratic to a democratic republic, most importantly during the antebellum era, the period leading up to the Civil War. And first, let me give a quick shout out to the APUSH students at Ocean Lakes High School in Virginia Beach, Virginia. Julio getting that five on AP Euro and 1,945 patty points, if I'm counting these correctly, and best of luck to AUNA push, get a five in that too, okay, get get like more than a five, I've got two, two hands, get a ten, you know, whatever you want, nice meeting you back during the live event, and also I want to thank my friend Jerry for giving me some international perspectives that are going to come into play later in this lecture. Now, first of all, it is very obvious that our republic has changed, all right, in 1789, you've got James Madison, the father of the Constitution, and the fourth president of the United States, uh, you know, who was known as Little Jimmy because of his short stature. His wife called him that. He was, I think, maybe about 5'4", five, 5'6", five, something like that. He was very soft-spoken. He was a nerd, really. I mean, not somebody that would be elected in today's Democratic Republic. And Madison and the framers designed a republic that was really going to be governed on an aristocratic basis, something that would have some Democratic elements, but at its core was aristocratic. Now, you see in our current president how much our republic has changed. Uh, James Madison wrote the Constitution. I I'm not really sure how much of the Constitution, uh, you know, President Trump could rattle back to you. Uh, President Trump sometimes uses vulgar language. He appeals to crowds. You know, there have been a lot of presidents in our history who have appealed uh, to the masses. And it's very difficult in our age today to be elected if you are not photogenic, telegenic. Uh, take a look at our presidents. You can see that Ike is the only bald president to serve two terms, uh, you know, just just all kinds of things like this. And as our republic has changed, I think that the rate of change was the greatest during the antebellum period, this period from 1820 to 1860 between the Missouri Compromise and the American Civil War. And this represents a period where we're going from this aristocratic republic to a democratic republic. Uh, you know, and this is something that, of course, started at the beginning and is still coming into into age now, but I believe that the American Civil War is where the Democratic Republic, the United States as a Democratic Republic, really reached maturity. And during this time, the rivalry of Henry Clay and Andrew Jackson really loomed large because Clay really represents, uh, beginning with the corrupt bargain and a lot of other things that I plan to tackle in videos later, uh, you know, Clay represents this old mentality of the aristocratic republic, whereas Jackson is was this leader who appealed to the masses. And if you think about it by 1860, you know, you start in 1820 and Henry Clay was really the most important figure in American politics. In the 1830s, you've got Jackson this more popular leader. And Abraham Lincoln, by 1860, someone who really shared a lot of Henry Clay's political beliefs, but used Andrew Jackson's methods and appealed to the masses and really understood that the United States was coming of age as a democratic republic. And so in 1820, you see that there was an election where it was nearly unanimous. One New Englander thought, you know what, I want to vote for a New England. Uh, you know, and so almost unanimous. And really how James Monroe was reelected is they had a caucus of members of Congress. This was between the first and second two-party systems. And the members of Congress said, we want to renominate James Monroe. And so the Electoral College got the memo. And there you go, because the elites had gotten together and they had decided who the president would be. Now, in 1860, after a very contentious election, a a plain spoken lawyer from Illinois was elected as the president of the United States in an election that led to the American Civil War. 
And I believe that this transition from an aristocratic republic to a democratic republic is very important in explaining the why of the American Civil War. Because the American Civil War occurred as the United States reached its maturity as a democratic republic. Now, remember by maturity, I don't mean in terms of it fully came to fruition. I mean in terms of somebody, you know, getting their driver's license, registering to vote, becoming an adult or something like that. So certainly an unfinished work, but I think that this is very important to note. And this is not to negate other causes of the Civil War. Certainly, slavery is something that looms large, but by itself, slavery offers an incomplete explanation of the American Civil War, because slavery existed in 1820, slavery existed in 1860. What was it that changed? And that's what I want to explore. What is it that's changing from one period to another that's leading to this American Civil War. Now, of course, there are some people who are going to be like, lost cause, neo-confederate, you know, all that kind of stuff, because, you know, you try to delve into some kind of complexity, grow up people. What I'm saying here isn't any different than what you're going to find in the AP U.S. history concept outline, where it says slavery and other economic, cultural, and political causes. Now, in this lecture, I want to focus on the cultural and political causes, specifically when we're going from an aristocratic republic to a democratic republic. Public. So as far as this goes, the, the big question of the antebellum period is what kind of republic are we going to have in the United States? And of course, before 1820, it's a republic that was aristocratic and federal, something that was controlled by elites and really dominated by the states. Uh, the United States as, you know, the United States are rather than the United States is, the union rather than the nation. You don't see see these things before the Civil War. We talk about the nation or anything like that. Now, as far as this goes during the antebellum period, there is this tension between those who want an aristocratic and federal republic and those who want a democratic and national republic. And after the Civil War, the United States definitely moves decisively in the direction of this democratic and national republic. So, Richie, all this talk about aristocratic republics and democratic republics, what do you mean by this? Why is it important? That's what I'm about to explain to you. Now, of course, a republican form of government is a government that draws its power from the people. Now, this can be directly or indirectly. In the case of a democratic republic, it's very direct. Or in the case of an aristocratic republic, the government's power comes from the people, but it doesn't mean that they're necessarily involved directly in its decision making and from the point of view of an aristocrat they really shouldn't be all that involved now i'm picking some kind of arbitrary dates but i would say that the united states existed as an aristocratic republic all the way through 1824. Now, I would say that the Democratic Republic really gets its birth in 1828 with the election of Andrew Jackson, but at the same time, it's not as if all of a sudden we become a democratic republic. Really, I would say that the aristocratic republic holds on uh, really all the way through the compromise of 1850. But let's go into the characteristics of an aristocratic republic, uh, what the framers really put together as a form of government in our original constitution. So in an aristocratic republic, a small elite visibly governs. Now, of course, we have the elite theory of politics and AP government, uh, you know, and you hear about people talking today about donors and all of that kind of stuff, whether there's an invisible elite that's calling the shots for our government is certainly a matter of discussion today, but in aristocratic republics, we see that a small elite visibly governs, and this was the United States uh, through 1824. There are property requirements for voting. So if you look at the early Roman Republic or the early United States, you see that People had to own a certain amount of property if they wanted to vote. They had to show that they have a stake in the government and society, that they're paying taxes and that sort of thing. Indirect presidential balloting. So, you know, as far as today, 
in every state we vote, we have a federal election through the Electoral College, but in all 50 states, individual voters express their preferences, and that's how the state cast its electoral votes, or at least how they're supposed to. The 2016 election got a little bit bizarre with that, but for the most part, that's the case. Now, in aristocratic republics, and when you look at the initial elections in the United States, presidential electors were appointed by the state legislature. It was indirect. And this is something in the 1820s and 1830s that states start moving toward this direct balloting. Now, of course, my home state of South Carolina kept doing the indirect balloting all the way through the 1860 election. And then, of course, during Reconstruction, abandoned that practice. Then again, that shows us really the Civil War as a turning point in American democracy. And popular campaigning uh, was frowned upon, is frowned upon in aristocratic republics. Rhetoric is kept within respectable limits. Uh, somebody's not supposed to be a demagogue. Somebody's not supposed to be trying to appeal to the masses because the masses are seen as dangerous. Uh, we get their power from them, but they should not be calling the shots in the government. And then there is a great deal of consensus and deal-making among elites and between groups. And this is why I discuss Henry Clay as an aristocrat, really. Because when you look at the Missouri Compromise, the Nullification Compromise, the Compromise of 1850, this is how you solve disputes in an aristocratic republic. Now, a democratic republic, which I've arbitrarily said, okay, from 1828 to present, even though this is really when the United States begins to operate by these principles, the aristocratic republic certainly does not just go away at this time. But in democratic republics, all citizens participate politically. There is universal suffrage in the citizen body. Of course, the definition of the citizen body has changed quite a bit since the antebellum period. After the Civil War, uh, it was inclusive of men of color. Then, after World War I, it becomes inclusive of women. So American democracy has gradually developed, but it is something that developed most quickly during this time. Direct presidential balloting, an acceptance of popular campaigning, uh, demagogues, pander to the masses. Anytime I hear somebody talk about somebody as a demagogue, I say wherever you have democracy, you're going to have demagogues because you get elected in a democracy by appealing to the masses. And candidates who can't appeal to the masses typically don't get elected. Go through your presidential elections and look, especially in the 20th century, which candidate was more appealing. And that's typically the candidate that wins. Certainly, uh, you know, going back, uh, going from JFK forward. Uh, but popular campaigning appeals to the masses. Jackson certainly used it. The 1840 election, Tippecanoe and Tyler II, the log cabin and hard cider campaign. And then there is an increased amount of partisanship and a winner-take-all mentality. Deal-making becomes politically difficult, and if we look at our country today, we see that that certainly seems to be the case, but it's really about building a majority coalition and winning, rather than trying to create some sort of consensus that you would be more likely to find in an aristocratic republic. Now, in this graphic, I've got the aristocratic republic from 1820 to 1850, looking at the antebellum period. So imagine that's what we've got at the beginning, and it's declining all the way through 1850. When we think about the 1820 presidential election, the Missouri Compromise, the corrupt bargain, the nullification compromise, the gag rule uh, concerning slavery and debates in the 1830s in Congress, Texas was not annexed immediately in the 1830s, and then finally the Compromise of 1850. 50. Whereas when you look at the Democratic Republic between 1829, where Jackson takes office, and 1860, when Lincoln is elected, you see Jackson's bank veto, the spoil system, Indian removal. Now you look at the Indians as a constituent minority within a republic, well, the majority wanted them gone, and so they were gone. This is a move that was very democratic. Texas annexation in the 1840s 
and manifest destiny, westward expansion. Uh, you know, your, your Whig element didn't want this, but the Democratic Party, uh, took advantage of this majority sentiment that favored manifest destiny. And of course, this is something that led to the American Civil War as, Nearly all of the debates about slavery uh, that uh, reached Washington were about slavery in the West specifically. And then when you go into the 1850s, there's really no more of this aristocratic republic, the Kansas-Nebraska Act, the Dred Scott decision, the 1860 presidential election, very much in the character of a democratic republic. And if you're not taking AP government now, you'll take AP government at some point, and it's worth taking a moment to look at models of representation, the trustee model versus the delegate model of representation. Now, the trustee model of representation is more likely to be found in an aristocratic republic. Elected representatives in the trustee model should weigh the best interests of their constituents against the common good. So just because something is good for my constituents doesn't mean it's good for the country. And if I am a trustee, I'm somebody who is elected because I'm a good person, a person of high character, that is a candidate-centered kind of approach that you should put somebody in office that is a good person, someone who will make decisions for the benefit of the whole. Edmund Burke, who was a British philosopher, said his unbiased opinion, his mature judgment, his enlightened conscience, he might not sacrifice to you, to any man or to any set of men living. Your representative owes you not his industry only, but his judgment, and he betrays instead of serving you if he sacrifices it to your opinion. So if your representative does what you want rather than what he or she knows is best, then that representative, according to the trustee model, has betrayed you as a voter, as a constituent. You choose a member indeed, but when you have chosen him, he is not a member of Bristol, but he is a member of Parliament. He's someone who should look out for the whole. Now, Daniel Webster of Massachusetts is someone who was a very influential politician in the antebellum period, and specifically during this period where the United States still functioned as an aristocratic republic. In his 7th of March speech during the debate on the Compromise of 1850, now keep in mind he's from Massachusetts, he's from New England, he started this speech by saying, I wish to speak today not as a Massachusetts man, nor as a Northern man, but as an American and a member of the Senate of the United States. So I'm not here to represent the perceived interest, the narrow perceived interest of my constituents. I'm here to represent the country as a whole and to give my thoughts on the situation taking a step back as a trustee. But I will allude to other complaints of the South, he says and especially to one which has, in my opinion, just foundation. And that is that there has been found at the North among individuals and among legislators a disinclination to perform fully their constitutional duties in regard to the return of persons bound to service who have escaped to the free states. Now, of course, that's fancy aristocratic language to talk about the enforcement of the Fugitive Slave Act of 1793. And what he says here is something that is not going to appeal to his constituents. He said, in that respect, the South, in my judgment, is right and the North is wrong. That my constituents have the wrong idea about this. And note where he says, in my judgment, okay, this is the way he's looking at this as a member of the Senate and thinking about the country as a whole. Now, also as a lawyer, one of the most gifted lawyers of his generation, and as a lawyer, as a statesman, he looks at the Constitution, he looks at the laws, and he says, look, there is a legal obligation on the part of the northern states to return fugitive slaves that have escaped from southern states. 
End of story. My constituents may not like it, but this is the agreement. Now, of course, that is that is thinking like an aristocrat. Now, the thing is, his constituents did not respond well to this. Uh, there was one constituent, uh, John Greenleaf Whittier, who was a poet who wrote a poem called Ichabod, which means no glory, without glory. This is taken from the Old Testament. Uh, and so... Daniel Webster, on the 22nd of July, only a few months after delivering the speech, resigned from the United States Senate. Now, granted, he became Secretary of State, but it's not something that you typically do if your constituents like you. He saw that he had absolutely no political future, because although Daniel Webster was part of this 1812 generation and part of this aristocratic republic, he found that he was unable to function in what was increasingly becoming a democratic republic where he was expected to do what his constituents wanted. Now, of course, he was replaced by Charles Sumner, who is most famous for his role in the Brooks Sumner incident where he was beaten half to death by a South Carolinian who was offended by some things that he said in the Senate. And... Charles Sumner was somebody who catered to his constituents, somebody who really goaded the South, and somebody who was a rabble-rouser, somebody who was cut out for this new democratic republic. But this is an interesting turning point where somebody like Daniel Webster, in his old age, finds himself no longer able really to exist as a political figure in a country that has changed drastically during his lifetime in terms of political culture. Now, remember that today, legally, there's nothing binding a member of Congress to the wishes of their constituents, donors, or their party, but culturally, members of Congress follow their own judgment at their own risk. Now, note the culture of the Democratic Republic came of age during the antebellum period. Now, a disclaimer here. I want to make, make sure that we are making clear that there was this clear revolution between 1820 and 1860, and that's not to say that elements of the Democratic Republic, like the party system, were not present in American political culture before 1820, or that elements of the aristocratic republic, like deal-making, didn't remain after 1860. In fact, in 1957, when senators got together to to put together their fave five, like who are the most illustrious men who have ever served in the Senate. Daniel Webster was one of these people. And of course, the antebellum senators, that was really the era of the glory of the Senate before the imperial presidency. So a hundred years later, Daniel Webster was seen as a hero. John F. Kennedy dedicated a chapter, or rather, you know, John F. Kennedy's uh, quasi-ghostwriter dedicated a chapter of Profiles uh, of Courage um, to Daniel Webster because Daniel Webster did what he thought was right against the wishes of his constituents. And so when we look at a democratic republic, the delegate model of representation is much more appropriate for this. Elected representatives should vote according to the interests of their constituents, political party, and major donors. Vote for a reliable person. Uh, this is an issues-centered campaign, a party-centered campaign. Uh, the person's character doesn't matter nearly as much. Uh, that election that happened in Alabama some time ago where people asked, why would anybody vote for that guy? Well, the thing is, he was going to vote their way in the Senate, so... Why not vote for him if we are in a democratic republic and there's a delegate model of representation? Now, in an aristocratic republic, you think, well, this guy's probably not a person of the type of character we would like to see in the United States Senate. But in a democratic republic, you're much more concerned, what does this person think on the issues? How is this person going to vote? Is this person going to be a reliable member of their political party and vote how I expect them to vote? I don't care about their judgment. That is the conduct of a democratic republic. And as Abraham Lincoln said in the Gettysburg Address, this creates a government of the people, by the people, 
for the people. The United States government had always been a government for the people, but it's really during the antebellum period and especially the Civil War that cements this into a government of the people, a government by the people, that democracy should triumph over this old aristocratic way of doing things. And when you look at the Gettysburg Address in this light, uh, you know, you see where, you know, Lincoln's vision for this war is something that the United States is going to come out of this a different country than it went into this. Lincoln had kind of a providential view of the Civil War, especially when you read his second inaugural address. Not so much different than what Jefferson wrote when he wrote that the Tree of Liberty must be refreshed from time to time with the blood of patriots and tyrants. And, you know, Lincoln felt like this war had been divinely ordained, uh, that, you know, this was supposed to happen. This is kind of part of a transition that America had to go through. Uh, note Lincoln's never talking about you know, traitors or all kinds of other fiery rhetoric. You know, Lincoln said this is a this is a civil war. The country is fighting itself, and a lot of patriots are dying on both sides of this conflict. So in addition to emancipation, which, you know, I certainly don't question as, you know, a legacy, not only a legacy of the Civil War, but slavery is a cause of the Civil War. But when we look at the legacy here, we see this other legacy of what form of popular government is the United States going to have? How is the United States going to come, come out of this identity crisis? Is it going to go the Confederate way that was more aristocratic and federal? Or was it going to go this way of a national democracy? Now, again, thank you to my friend Jerry, who put kind of a global perspective on this. Uh, he was talking to me this morning. We were discussing the English Civil War. You know, this was a war about what form of government are we going to have? Are we going to have a government by the king as an absolute monarch or a government by parliament in cooperation with the king so that you have a constitutional monarchy? We see another war that was fought about this. What kind of government are we going to have? This is a reason that people kill each other. The French Revolution, a very similar thing as France was going through this change in government, a very radical and quick change. Uh, you have this chaos that went around with the French Revolution. And the United States was in a similar position, having gone through this transition and unable to agree on what it was and finally had to fight it out. The Irish Civil War also had uh, some of these qualities. This is something that I need to look into. My friend Sean, I'll definitely talk to you sometime and also talk to Jerry a little more about this because when I look at the Irish Civil War, I'm like, wait, what's the difference between an Irish nationalist and an Irish Republican? Like, I, I can't really tell. I mean, it seems very insignificant to me, but a lot of Irish people were willing to kill each other over it. So we see these examples of, you know, what kind of government are we going to have? And we're going to have to fight for it. And one side's going to have to prevail over the other. So what kind of republic will the United States have? Before 1820, it was undisputed. This will be an aristocratic republic. Remember, we have this period of antebellum tension between 1820 and 1860. And finally, the Civil War is what established the United States as a democratic republic. Now, that is not to say that remnants of the aristocratic and federal republic don't still exist, because they certainly do. But no one would really question that the United States is today a democratic republic. And I don't think it's any accident, uh, this book here by Sean Willens, The Rise of American Democracy, um, that it starts at the beginning of the nation's history, but it ends with the Civil War. And of course, like I did, just mentioned uh, the unfinished business of the Civil War that we still deal with today, of course. But no other time saw a greater transition from aristocracy to democracy than the antebellum period, and no single event cemented this transition like the American Civil War. Well, I hope you enjoyed the lecture. I'll be lecturing more in the coming months on the antebellum period and the Civil War. Go ahead and leave a comment. What would you like to see me tackle in particular? And I'll be looking at those and kind of figuring out what direction I want to go with this, but I certainly want to delve 
deeper into this topic and make sure you find me on social media if you haven't already. And of course, remember everyone, it is always a pleasure.